to everyone watching and welcome to this episode today where I'm interviewing Professor Matthew Cobb and you're a professor at the University of Manchester, which is where I am. And is it in zoology? Well, it's in the School of Biological Sciences. I'm, I, my title is Professor of Zoology, but uh, that's just the title. Right. And, you, and you've written this uh, book on a history of the idea of the brain which uh, I picked up about two months ago now, and it was a really interesting read. And you basically cover in the book how people have conceived of the brain historically, so some kind of philosophical perspectives. Uh, there's a bit of like philosophy of science in there, I guess. There's a bit of um, people figuring out different kind of biological models, um, figuring out concepts that we might take for granted about the way the nervous system works, but um, trying to use language um, to do with like steam engines, for example, and stuff like that. So it's really interesting going all the way through. My, I guess my first question is to do with what was it that prompted you to write this book? Were you just approached by a publisher or was it something that you were interested in uh, just doing to systematically go through um, that kind of thought? Uh, well, I, th I can't really remember, but in 2015, uh, I had just finished writing a book about the uh, the genetic code. Uh, life's greatest secret, and I think my then publisher at Profile Books, uh, John Davy, I think it was his idea. I think he said, "Why don't you write something about the brain?" Um, and the book we agreed I would write uh, is not at all the book that I've published, okay. which is okay with them. They're quite okay with that, but uh, it went through a, a very long gestation. I mean, it took me about four years to write, partly because I got distracted by. All sorts of other nonsense, some of which is listed in the acknowledgements in the book. Um, but also because uh, it took me a long time to work out what exactly I was going to write about. And the, the first, you know, the version that we sold, I sold them, was um, a really boring kind of one thing, one damn thing after another kind of very crude history of neuroscience. And it was while I was writing it and got a bit kind of stuck uh, that I couldn't, I finally made a breakthrough uh, and realized what the book was supposed to be about. Um, and that is that it, it's actually largely about the ways in which we have thought about the brain. And that's where the title came. The title came, right. it wasn't mine, it wasn't the original title we had. Um, but the book is in fact about the ways that people have thought about the brain using metaphors in particular uh, from technology, which of course has developed over the hundreds of years, thousands of years in some cases that I, I write about. Uh, and I realized that that was actually a thread running through the book was rather interesting uh, and actually gave us some insights and made the whole thing a bit more, uh, less pedestrian than right. it was turning into. Well, I guess I also wanted to ask how you went about kind of tackling this challenge. I mean, if, you, if you've got this idea of for for any topic to do like a whole kind of history of it or um, how humans have like um, thought about this this massive like corpus of knowledge, um, how, how do you go about like passing that up and presenting it to an audience as well? What, how did you go about um, tackling that challenge? Well, one of the advantages of history <laughs> is that it starts at the beginning and keeps on going, which is basically yeah, what yeah. I did. Um, so I started at the beginning. Um, I mean, I'm not I'm not being entirely facetious. That is basically what right, I did. Right. Um, so some of this stuff, what, what I realized as well, I mean, so I have a, though I'm a professor of zoology, uh, I have a degree in psychology back in the day when neuroscience barely existed as a term, and certainly didn't exist in terms of departments or degrees or anything like that. Um, and the psychology that I studied at Sheffield um, was uh, basically a lot of what's in the book. And I realized that the things that are in there, in particular, in I mean, the book's divided into three halves, uh, past, present and future. And again, that just kind of emerged actually quite late on, uh, thinking about what I'd written and the way it worked. And then we realized we needed, in fact, it needs to be divided up quite explicitly for the reader to say, okay, we've got this bit and now we're doing this bit and then we got this bit. Um, and I realized that many of the themes about it, in particular, what happened 
in the present, which is what I call the last 50 years, basically, or it's from the middle of the 1950s to 1960s, our current view about what the brain does, about how it works and so on, really kind of gelled uh, into a series of metaphors and ideas and concepts and approaches. Uh, and I realized that much of that part of the book, that, that um, present part of the book is stuff that, you know, A, I'd lived through some of it, and I knew a lot <laughs> of the people who had done the work, or I met them, or I'd read their papers when they came out. But these were also things that I had been worrying about for the last 40 odd years. So there was actually quite some, it was actually quite satisfying to write in that respect, because it meant mm -hmm. that there were things that kind of, you know, I, I remembered from the 1970s. Thought, wait a minute, I, I'm sure I was told about that. Oh, yes, gosh, I remember reading that paper. That was brilliant. Uh, so that was a lot of fun, actually exploring my own uh, past. Uh, I guess there's one aspect that didn't get explored, and I hint at this, um, and that's my own professional work, which is on the sense of smell. Um, and one of the interesting things is the difference between, uh, or, or rather how much of our view of the brain, and when people talk about the brain, you know, they really mean the human brain or the mammalian brain. I don't, but that's what most right. people think of. The brain is the human brain. But our view of the human brain and the mammalian brain has been so uh, focused on views of, uh, on studies of vision. Right. So that particular sensory modality and the insights that we've got from it um, have been of one particular kind. However, if we were studying, uh, were to use the optic of olfaction, the sense of smell, we'd have rather a different view mm. about how it works. And in fact, um, somebody else you might want to get on, uh, this book, Smellosophy, right. um, by my good friend, uh, and Sophie Barwich does exactly that. And this came out uh, earlier this year. Fantastic book. Anyway, I'm plugging somebody else's. Yeah. You want to e email her, get her on. Get her yeah, on definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I, th I think something that you really bring out in the book is sort of um, how much the, the language that we have to kind of express ideas sort of um, funnels or um, shapes the way that we come to kind of discover new knowledge. And so I suppose if, if most of that research is being done in terms of vision, that's going to always like distort the the way that we um, conceptualize new things as it comes through if uh, if smell is like very different, for example, as, as uh, maybe we'll talk about with like computation and stuff a bit later. Um, but I was I, I was thinking if we, if we start at the start then, so you kind of begin by talking about some of the old older philosophical conceptions of how people conceive of consciousness as being in the heart you know there's like famous um bible verses which talk about that worldview um egyptians who used to obviously pull the organs out through the noses and stuff like that um so why did people conceive of consciousness as being in the heart and what were some of some of those points of view that people had well because that's what it feels like <laughs> it's kind of obvious isn't it right i mean nobody you know, look, this is like the, the, the sun going around the earth. I mean, you know that the earth goes around the sun, but you only know that because you've been told it um, and because you have been told that everything right. else about physics and about satellites and all that all fits together. But mere observation doesn't tell you that at all. It's really very, very complicated. Um, and it, that's why it took a long time for people to work it out. They need to do very, yeah. very careful observations of movement of the stars and so on for it actually become apparent. Similarly, um, the and, and obviously in terms of everyday existence, it doesn't make any difference. It feels like the sun's going around the earth and that's the way it is. Um, similarly, the, the, the feelings we have about our body and our, our, our emotions because that's really what people are talking about. So when you say consciousness, I mean, I, I right. inwardly bristled a bit because this is quite a okay. highfalutin, very, very recent uh, abstract way of speaking about what's going on inside our heads, about which I think we know basically nothing would be my view. Um, and I certainly make no claims to any great perceptions uh, in that respect. Mm -hmm. But if you just think about it, um, you you might know because you've watched Inside Out or some film that you've got a little person inside you peering out through your eyes and sensing everything. But actually, what it feels like when you're excited, uh, when you're frightened, it's in your body. 
Uh, it's not in your head. You don't have any immediate perception that things are, in fact, up here. Your sense organs are. So that's where you're hearing and you're fearing, feeling. But where you fear, where you're excited, where you're happy, they're all elsewhere. And there's been a load of very recent studies uh, by some Finnish researchers asking loads and loads of people exactly that question. And where they say they feel their emotions, a whole range of feelings is in various bits of their body. Right. It's not you know where they feel pride. It's here, and all our language uh, about wearing your heart on your sleeve. He was down at heart, and blah blah blah. Every language has uh, these things, which are kind of fossils. They're linguistic fossils of the old way of viewing things. And mm. if you swap brain for heart in any of those phrases, it just feels weird. It doesn't make any sense at all. So, yeah. in fact, everyday experience tells you <laughs> that it's not just in your your, your brain is not. And in fact, what it does is to undermine that nonsense, that philosophical nonsense about, you know, brains in vats and, you know, fantasies about uploading your ideas, your thoughts onto the Internet. There's a there was an article about oh, 20 odd years ago in, in a, a neuroscience journal, which had the perhaps trivial, but nonetheless extremely important title. The brain has a body. Our brains are not you know, just completely abstract. They are absolutely part of our physiology and they're interacting with them and our emotions and our feelings and all the complexity of being a human and having those inner experiences and that inner mental life, whatever it is, uh, are linked. And we are not simply this mind floating about. What's interesting is that there's a, you can sense with all this stuff and this post-human transhuman nonsense about uploading minds and all the rest of it is that in fact they're going back to pre-scientific understanding of what mind is because they are conceiving it as a, a spirit in fact like right. Descartes. Descartes thought that there was the spirit and the body and these two interacted there was this non-physical matter no nobody understands what that means but that's the kind of thing he talked about which is the spirit and that interacts with the, the world of the physical in the pineal gland, he argued. Now, other people have well, it's fairly soon realized that every every vertebrate there is has a pineal gland. So, you know, his claims to human specificity in that respect were clearly wrong. But that idea that there's a separation between mind and body or mind and physical substrate, if you want to put it in those mm. terms, you've got software and hardware. I mean, this, you know, this musky and nonsense uh, is still floating around today and people buy into it and they think it's really hip, whereas, in fact, they're merely repeating profound errors uh, from centuries ago. There you go. Well, we, 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 can, uh, we can come on to some of that stuff um, a little bit later as we come on to, I suppose, maybe some of the errors of present and uh, speculation about future. But I thought one interesting thing that I wasn't familiar with with um before reading your book were um a guy called galen and some of his experiments which mm -hmm. were um you, you said linguistic fossils but i guess they're like a, a, histor a historical fossil of um i suppose human thinking away from um thinking we can sort of introspect to figure out the way the world is and um maybe like naturalist type thinking rather than um interpreting things in terms of gods and stuff like that where one of the experiments he did that i came across after this was that he took um like eggs at various sta stages i think 60 days in uh, like the cycle to hatching and he opened them up and looked at like the way that they developed and, and this was like in stark contrast to i think the rest of the culture at the time where people were sort of thinking you know you almost just sit in your armchair and uh, figure out the ultimate nature of things um and you talked about some pretty horrific experiments that galen did to sort of show um that whatever mental stuff is it's kind of happening in this organ that's in the head rather than in the heart could you talk a little bit about some of those uh, yeah the squeamish might wish to put me on mute for about <laughs> two minutes i'll wave when it's over i mean seriously i mean a lot of people uh, uh yeah. find it distressing and it is distressing uh, and i didn't uh well i did spare you actually some of the grisly details in but there's a number of points in the book at which it gets a bit grim and i, I warn readers that they can skip over the next paragraph or two uh, until it's safe um so i i think the first thing is we need to be very careful about what Galen was. So Galen's this 
uh, incredibly complex person who mm, some people will have come across as the man who developed the idea of humours, that we have four humours. I can never remember what they are. There's black bile, right. choleric, and I can't remember. But these four things that interact and go to contribute our to our well-being and that if you end up with these things out of balance uh you can be ill and this passed for is what what passed for medicine for sent for millennia millennia i mean people were having medics in in oxford had to study galen's ideas and pass and examine them up until about the 1850s so this is a you know really really significant ideas most of which were complete and utter rubbish um and he uh, i think what i he wasn't a scientist, right? So you talked about an experiment. Now, we can talk about it being an experiment. You've got to remember these people are, you can't simply look back at them and think, okay, well, they're, you know, they're a scientist or a physician or whatever. Galen, for example, I mean, as far as I was aware, he was this kind of philosopher who was interested in medicine. Not at all. If much more interesting than that, he was a physician. He used to, um, he used to treat uh, gladiators who'd been wounded in the uh, in the in the arena. Uh, so he's working at the end of the first century uh, in the Common Era, and he was born in what is now Turkey. Uh, he was uh, a Greek, uh, but he was a Roman citizen. So that gives you some idea of the complexity of the of, of the person. He also wrote poetry. He wrote philosophy. He had a he wrote in a huge library of books, many of which have been lost, unfortunately. So he's an incredibly significant person. Now, what did he do? Well, various people had argued, but the Greeks had thought about this and they they were kind of in two schools-ish. Aristotle had argued that the brain was merely a, a device for, for cooling. It was a cooling organ and the heart was where all the action is because it moved. You know, when you're excited, when something happens to your ideas, to your thinking, you can detect it in the heart by changes in activity and motion, movement was one of the main things they were interested in. On the other hand, the brain, if you open up a head, is just this kind of mushy stuff. It didn't really seem to do very much. Um, various uh, Greeks began to do, well, it's hard to say, they may well have actually been not just dissections, but vivisections on living prisoners um, in Alexandria uh, in the four, first century uh, before the common era. And they noticed, well, what's fairly obvious, that your sense organs are all connected to your brain. And so they began to argue, well, maybe it's the, the brain that's actually doing all this business because they're not connected to the heart. So, you know, perception and so on would seem to be going on up here rather than down here. And Galen had an argument uh, with uh, various people about this. And what he was able to do was to show that the voice was produced by the brain. Now, he knew this already because there's something called the, uh, the, uh, the thoracic nerve, which is what I'm using now. And this is one of the great examples in evolutionary biology of bad design. Right. So if I was going to design the control of the brain, uh, the, the control of the voice, now my this is the bit of my brain that's controlling it. It's called Broca's area. And this is where I'm actually speaking. So if you were designing a robot, if Elon Musk was doing this, you'd just put a wire going from here to here. That would make perfect sense. Bizarrely enough, it starts here, the, the nerve, it goes all the way down underneath the heart and then comes back up. So it's about a meter long, whereas it needs to be about 20 centimeters, a meter and a half long. In the case of something like a, um, a, um, a diplodocus or something like that, it would have been about 40 meters long. So it's, it, it's probably the longest nerve that has ever been, the, the, this organ in the diplodocus. So you've got this rather weird situation and Descartes, uh, <laughs> Galen was able to, uh, he, he noticed that these um, uh, gladiators who'd been wounded, if they were wounded in this nerve, they could right. no longer speak. So he'd actually made a, a, a medical observation when he was kind of patching them up. He couldn't actually do anything more than sew them up and hope they wouldn't die. So what he did was to, it was more a kind of demonstration he, he had an actual debate with one of his opponents who said, no, it's all about the heart. And he did this experiment, which became very famous and was reproduced through the millennia uh, in drawings, but was, as far as I know, never done again because people just accepted the word of the ancients. What he did was to get a poor old pig. Pig is, of course, there's no anesthetics in these, those days. Uh, the pig strapped down uh, with chains onto a table 
and it's opened up. And so, of course, it's making a bit of a racket. And he asks, invites his opponent, his heart uh, proponent, to hold the pig's heart, to stop it beating, which he does. And of course, the pig carries on making a terrible noise. He then opens up the skull, which is more of a uh, more unpleasant, you might think, because you've got to kind of chisel it open. Um, and then he invites his proponent to push down on the brain. He does this, and of course, the pig instantly goes unconscious and stops making a noise. Take the hand off the brain, and the horror returns. So what this showed was that the voice, that's all you could actually say, was the production of noise, right. the voice, was controlled by the brain. Now, although you might say, well, that sounds pretty decisive. Why didn't everybody immediately go, oh, gosh, Galen's right, because they didn't. You know, it was another, I mean, there's no moment, there's no particular time when everybody decides, oh, it is the brain. It's a very, very slow process in the 17th century. When I say everybody, I'm talking about scientists, because for most people, or embryonic scientists, for most people around the world, carried on as our everyday experience tells us that if they thought about this at all, it's in the heart. And all cultures have had this. I did quite a lot of amateur anthropology, reading accounts from uh, the American natives, uh, for example, the, the native tribes all in the, along the American, in the Americas, in the South of America and in North America, who were talked to, discussed with in the 19th century by anthropologists who went out and asked them about their beliefs. And they all felt what we all feel, that the heart is where the mm. spirit lay. And there's a rather nice story um, about uh, uh, one of the early, uh, Carl Jung, one of the early psychoanalysts. He, in the 1920s, he went to talk to one of the Pueblo Indians uh, in New Mexico about their beliefs. And uh, this man said to Jung that he thought that the white men were crazy. And Jung seemed quite surprised about that. I'm not sure why, but anyway, he was very surprised and said, why do you think this? And uh, this Pueblo Indian said, well, <laughs> you all think you think with your heads. And Jung was genuinely perplexed and said, but where do you where do you think that you think? And he said, we think here. So we don't actually know what the connection between those ideas and the ideas we recorded in the 19th century and pre-Columbian, uh, so pre-contact with the West ideas, but it seems pretty likely, and the same goes for most of the rest of the world, that most people for most of the time have thought that it's your heart that does the thinking. And that's why Galen's idea didn't immediately change everything, his experiment, even though it's very widely known, people carried on agreeing with Aristotle because the whole thing came as a package. Aristotle's ideas were tremendously influential. They were later kind of fused with the church's ideas. So they actually became part of every, you know, absolutely the dogma of life uh, in the kind of 13th century. And to question them was to, you ended up unraveling everything. So Galen's ideas were very, very much uh, a minority, even though they were known. And it was only in the, the 16th, 17th century that as dissection became more apparent to reveal the, the simplicity of the heart, as Harvey, uh, the, the, the English scientist put it, it's a pump, which is what it is. <laughs> it's, right. all, it's a very weird kind of pump, don't get me wrong, but it is a pump. Um, right. Whereas the brain is just this incredibly complex organ that is virtually impossible to understand. And that's kind of what eventually shifted people's thinking away from the obvious, you know, the everyday account that, well, it's in your heart, you know, your thinking's in your heart to this idea that it's in your brain. So, so in the book, you do um, mention a few other thinkers throughout that time, but it did, you also talk about how it does seem that um, basically dogmatism um, and this idea that sort of, well, the ancients figured it out at this point, even though there's very intelligent and history is going to be more complicated than my sort of um, brief interpretation here, but um, that, you know, there's very intelligent people, but there isn't like a, a real paradigm shift perhaps until um, Descartes. And then I think Leibniz is slightly after Descartes and you talk mm -hmm. about how Leibniz's mill is this sort of thought experiment then as people start thinking about, you know, the brain's got something involved, but it's like, 
you know, if I, I hear um, philosophers today talk about water pumps. You know, you'd keep if you keep adding water pumps together, you'll never get um, yeah. a thinking mind. Or um, I think it's a Chinese nation with radios is the philosophical thought experiment. And and you talk about how um, Leibniz's mill sort of also sets the scene then for this for this kind of division. But there's also um, other groups of thinkers who are seeing these new inventions through electricity. Um, and I think you've got a chapter on forces as well around, around the same time um, and, and how that's making people think, well, maybe there's something wrong with the philosophy here. And if we just look into um, where we're making progress with, with this electricity stuff, with um, physics, may, maybe that's going to tell us a bit more about um, a, a bit more about how, how we think, how, how we're like machines that think. Could you talk a bit about how electricity um changed the way that people conceptualized what what it is that the mind is doing yeah i think the key point is that um i mean philosophy is really important right you know philosophers are if you want to know what good is that's fantastic they can tell you what is good i can't Ele electrons arranged good wise <laughs> well <maybe>. yeah. <laughs> um there's uh you know they thought about this for millennia but when it comes to working out how the universe works and how bodies work, then in the end, experimentation will give you your answer and not philosophy. Now, philosophers can remain happy about, relaxed, I think, about this situation in one respect, because the two big issues that they've really been worrying away at, the fundamental questions, apart from what is good and, you know, whether you should press the switch on the trolley to only kill seven people rather than nine or whatever stupidity they're thinking about. Um, the really big questions, what is the universe made of and what is consciousness? Scientists still can't answer, right? So the physicists have yeah. discovered that, you know, probably 80% of the universe is unobservable and they don't know what it is, this dark matter they think it might be made of, um, assuming all their calculations are correct. And anybody who claims they know what consciousness, they can prove what consciousness is, um, is mistaken. Let's just put it politely. Um, I mean, I'm fairly confident of what it is, but I can't actually demonstrate it. I'm confident it's merely the activity of electrons in my brain, um, but I can't demonstrate that. But everything... Yeah. Every piece of evidence we have goes in that direction and none goes in the direction of it being some weird quantum field or, you know, some non-material matter or any of the other ideas that people have come up with. So the, the, the issue is that as science is developing in the 17th and 18th centuries, science, let's just call them scientists, it's not the right term, but let's just call them that. Um, they're grappling. People are trying to understand the material basis of physiology and anatomy and its functional basis are grappling with analogies, metaphors, ways of thinking about that, the, the, those, that matter. And they're making this parallel all the time with technology. And Descartes did this in terms of water pressure. He thought that the brain and the body might work uh, like these uh, hydraulic statues that he saw uh, in Paris in the 1630s, which kind of crude animatronics. However, it was very quickly demonstrated that if you chop a nerve, you don't get a kind of spurt of high pressure of right. some uh, mysterious fluid. There's, there's the stuff in there, but it's not under pressure. So clearly that was wrong. And it was very quickly demonstrated in that respect. But people still kept on trying to think of metaphors, for example, uh, the idea that because it was known that nerves, you did something at one end of a nerve and something happened at the other. You'll notice I'm not using words like transmission, right? Because that's much, much later. But you do something at one end of a nerve and something happens at the other. You know, you can tickle this end and this end, which is connected to a, a muscle, will then uh, lead the muscle to contract. And so people thought about, well, maybe this is a bit like, you know, if I hit a plank of wood, I can feel the vibration at the other end. Maybe it's a bit like that. So they didn't actually think it was a vibration. Well, some people did, but... Then they say, well, wait a minute, nerves aren't kind of taut like piano wires. So, you know, every time they tried to find a physical metaphor, reality showed, well, it's it's not like that. But on the other hand, there's a, you know, there's a kind of general idea, the idea that might be this movement of, of, of something down the um, down the, the nerve that began to to take hold. And with the 
the mastery of electricity and its discovery in the second half of the 18th century, then it was fairly soon noted that electricity could cause movement. And again, we're back to that idea of movement being a, a fundamental uh, uh, element or proof of uh, mental activity or being, you know, being related to it. And this was generally done, this was done both in humans. So one particular uh, French philosopher, you, people discovered that you could, you could get, you could store electricity, you could generate electricity uh, by rubbing um, felt, uh, so cloth on amber, for example, uh, a bit like, you know, getting a rubber bl a balloon, rubbing it on your, your jumper, and sticking it on the wall. That's very low static charge but you can actually generate larger charges store it in what's called a leiden jar uh, because it was first developed in in leiden in holland and then release quite substantial charges in an instant so you can't you can't release it slowly but you get bang a sudden uh powerful release so one french philosopher d'alembert uh, got uh, 200 or maybe it was 400 no 200 200 monks to hold hands and so you got this chain of humans, whatever it's, 400 odd meters long. <laughs> and at one end, he he connects the poor monk at one end to uh, to this very, very powerful generator discharge of electricity. And the shock goes along the 400 meters and they all jump one after another. And oh, how we did laugh. Um, so this is probably like a bit like touching more worse than touching a, a, a cow fence, an electric fence to keep cows in. So it's a pretty hefty charge. No harm was done to the monks, but it was showed you there's something going through there. So the question then came, you can do the same thing with um, with frogs' legs, even on a, uh, people noticed that even when there was electricity in the air, literally, so if you've got a thundery day, people were studying um, dissected frogs' legs would have these things hanging up, you know, getting ready to do their experiments. And these bits of leg would start twitching so the question then came is well is this electricity just a powerful irritant because you know then you by scratching or putting acid on nerves you could get muscles to contract so is electricity just an irritant or is it actually in the nerves themselves is it actually that what was called the animal spirit. This is what uh, Descartes thought was in the uh, in the nerves term that went way back to the uh, ancient Greeks. And when when they talked about animal spirit, um, they didn't mean it was to do with animals. It, the animal comes from animation, so it means movement. It's the right. thing that produces movement. Was electricity the animal spirit? This is what kind of people began began to think about at the end of the uh, 18th century, and. To try, there was a huge argument between Galvani, hence galvanized, and who said it was animals, electricity was in nerves, and Volta, who said it wasn't. And uh, Volta tried to prove uh, this. He had a whole lot set of arguments about why uh, it, Vol um, why um, Galvani's claim was wrong. But what he ended up doing at the beginning of the 19th century, and I didn't have any idea of this before I started uh, work on the book. Was that he got very interested in uh, what was called tor what are called torpedoes, which are electric fish, okay. and uh, it was known that a particular organ in the this electric eel, well, it's not the electric fish, which give you a shock, had a particular structure, and so Volta decided to imitate this by putting layers of acid and of uh, zinc, uh, acid soaked cardboard and zinc into a, a pile. And he ended up producing the battery. So the battery, right. what we call a battery, but in other languages like French, for example, is still known as um, um, pile, a pile, because it was a pile of uh, layers. And we still use the same term for the atomic pile <laughs> in a nuclear reactor. It's called a pile. I mean, really, it should be a battery because we've kind of dumped the pile business in English. Um, so Volta actually gen creates the, the battery in uh, a, a bit of biomimicry. He was trying to work out how the electric fish produced its charge he ends up producing the battery and that was first published in 1801 that is what changes the whole of the 19th century that's what begins to make people start to think about okay we've now got not a 
a sudden discharge which can make a lot of monks jump in the air, but we've now got a source, a constantly releasing source of electricity. And they then use that in some pretty gruesome experiments very, very quickly, uh, for example, to show that uh, a dead body, human body, could be animated by using this constant electric power through the battery that Volta uh, had invented. <clears throat> and this is, uh, if you do that, and this was done in private, it wasn't done in, in, in public, there are no instances that I came along with a public demonstration of a human body being uh, stimulated in this way. Uh, but uh, from about 1803, people were doing, you know, somebody would be hanged for terrible crime. Their body would be taken down immediately, whisked into a little room. And then uh, a load of the great and the good uh, would see this uh, poor ex person having electrodes put onto them. And, you know, their eyes would open. Uh, all their muscles would start being active. So this is incredibly dramatic. There's no sign of life, but it did appear that way. And it was probably from a similar kind of demonstration in about 1813, 1814 with animals, because these were done for the public uh, in both shows, in theatres, but also at the Royal Institution, where Humphrey Davy carried out one of these demonstrations. It was probably there that a young woman called Mary, God Mary Godwin, who was about 14 at the time, uh, probably saw this demonstration of the animation of uh, dead animals with batteries and then a few years later, uh, when she was stuck in a very rainy uh, time, had a very rainy time with her husband who'd run away with her, um, uh, Percy Shelley, uh, that then Mary Shelley wrote uh, Frankenstein. So probably the inspiration for that came from uh, seeing one of these demonstrations. But this kind of convinced people that what was in the nerves or nerves were responding and brains and bodies were responding not just to electricity because it was an irritant, which it is actually, but also because there is electricity of some bizarre kind in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And indeed, from the very, it's, I, again, it's fascinating, right from the very beginning, in fact, before, before they had batteries, people were wandering around the countryside in Europe, in England in particular, giving a form of electroconvulsive therapy using one of these generators. So uh, Jean, what's his second name? Jean-Pierre? I forgot his third name. Uh, no, I won't Ma be able to help, sorry. <laughs> Ma, the leader of the French uh, Revolution. And John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, were both <laughs> itinerant electricians, as they were called. And they would go around with one of these generators, which is basically a wheel, and you whizzed it round, and you get somebody who was feeling... Uh, depressed and you'd put the electrodes on either side of the brain bang give them a shock and people claimed as they do now um that this made them feel better and it's, i found some accounts when batteries were developed later on uh i found a number of accounts from the early years of the 19th century of you know anecdotal but very real of people who were clearly suffering from something like depression who had this electrical treatment and found some sucker from it I, I realize I should have asked before. Um, Sorry, we started, I went on too way. fast. Let's no, say. no, it's okay. I'm just wondering how you are for time because it's looking like if, if you've okay. only got 25 or so minutes left, um, I can kind of prove my questions a bit more. But if you've got a bit longer to stay. No, no, we can go on to about quarter past. That's fine. Okay, no problem. Um, so another sort of um, big change as well, I think, in people's thinking is the idea of, well, not evolution originally, I suppose, I suppose natural selection or survival of the fittest. And um, how does that then change? Is it is it more that that changes the way that people conceive themselves in the natural order? So it's like maybe mind isn't so special or does that make some important contributions to um, the way that people think of the kind of machinery that's um, in, in human brains? Well, it kind of both, I think. Uh, so famously in uh, the evolution, uh, the origin of species by uh, natural selection, uh, Charles Darwin limits his comments about human evolution to about one line at the end. And he says something like, all this will cast light on the mysteries of humanity. I can't remember the exact phrase. Yeah. Um, there's all sorts of complicated, let's leave out why he did that, but he did do that. Mm -hmm. But he'd been interested in this from the very beginning. We can see this from his notebooks. And he was very interested 
in the link between mind and brain. And he read voraciously. And we can see in the books that are in his library, his actual notes. And he, in about 1830, just after, 1837, just after he'd come back from the, the Beagle, voyage around the world in the Beagle, which is where he really starts to think about why there are all these various kinds of organisms and begins to study the different ideas that might explain it, and eventually comes up with this fantastic theory. He, he reads a copy of this. He was in, a, in his flat uh, at the top of Carnaby Street uh, in London, and he reads this uh, kind of popular science book from the time, which says that the, uh, explains basically, we don't know what the link is between brain structure and mind. And Darwin puts a line by the side of this and says, it doesn't matter, there just has to be one. So Darwin, very sensibly, a bit like me, I've copied him, <laughs> isn't particularly worried about how it works yeah. because he doesn't, he knows in the 18, 19th century, he can't figure it out. I, I think we can't figure it out now. So it's not something that interests me. I don't, I'm not, people were very surprised. I'm not actually interested in consciousness because I, I think it's unknowable at the moment. I don't think we have the tools. Right. Uh, so it's not something that I professionally wish to pursue. And I have yet to read anything that's particularly impressed me. Uh, from a scientific point of view. So what Darwin uh, does is to, this, I thought this was absolutely brilliant. What he says is, look, there is a link between the brain, this physical structure, and behavior, mind, habits, whatever you want to call it. And if there is that physical link, then natural selection can work on the brain. It can change structures, just like it changes the structure of a bird's wing or its beak or a moth's color or anything like that. It can mm. therefore change behavior. And that was Darwin's, I mean, he, he can't prove it. I mean, I can't prove it. <laughs> you know, it's a, if, you, if you want to get, you know, philosophers want to get fancy with this, then it's an article of faith, if you wish. Uh, but I repeat, as I said earlier on, all of the evidence goes in this direction. So there does come a point at which you think, well, I'm not actually going to worry about whether I'm wrong or not until some decent evidence comes up uh, to contradict me. And Darwin wasn't going to, he didn't, he didn't, for lots of complicated reasons, he didn't want to write about this. But in the end, he had to because his uh, great friend and colleague, the man who came up simultaneously with the idea of evolution by natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, in the late 1860s, he, um, he got spiritualism. And this was a time where, in general, much of, in a way, to use another metaphor, the steam has started to go out of some of the, the, the materialist confidence of scientists and thinkers in the 19th century uh, and what was called the the age of doubt with a capital d began to okay. settle over over europe that maybe the ideas that they had about that's uh, also where you get the beginning of thermodynamics the idea that perhaps this whole system is going to end because right. you know the, the second law of thermodynamics says the universe is going to come to an end it's all going to be horribly cold and a whole set of concepts reduced people's confidence about how things work and similarly about how the mind and brain it wasn't nobody could figure it out we still can't uh, but they began to worry about it and, and Russell did this in particular he decided that um, humans were an exception that we were not part of the, sub, the creation of evolution by natural selection and in particular human thought could not be so Darwin didn't really have any option, he didn't want to, but he had no option but to write about this and to show, well, you know, Alfred, you're wrong. Um, and so he wrote, in fact, two books in one, uh, which are called um, The Descent of Man and um, uh, it's called the second one, The Evolution of Sex, I can't remember, uh, Sexual Selection. So these are two books dealing with two things that aren't dealt with, which are incredibly important right. for Darwinian theory, but which aren't present in the origin of species. So human evolution on the one hand and uh, sexual selection, which counts for things like peacock's tail and so on, on the other. And the uh, Descent of Man book, I mean, there are some passages which are a bit tiresome uh, for today, uh, both his views on women uh, and on different racial groups, uh, kind of as you might expect. Um, but they're not the heart of his argument. That's not what he's getting at. What he's trying to get at is that there is a material basis to uh, our consciousness and that it has been shaped 
by natural selection because natural selection can change the brain. And he got his mates to do lots of dissections of different um, or show comparatively different primate um, brains and show, as Darwin pointed out, there's no difference of there's no qualitative difference between a monkey's brain you know, gorilla's brain and ours. You can't look at it and say, well, oh, we've got this big lump here, this big, you know, strange structure. There's nothing like that. You can't, I mean, it's different in size and proportions, but basically it looks exactly the same. So this slow, gradual difference was, of course, was what exactly Darwin had been arguing about from the outset. And if you look at the, the gorilla's uh, skeleton, it's got all the same structures. They're in different proportions and they're slightly differently uh, you know, put together, but basically it's exactly the same, the same with our brain. And so he therefore argued that our ideas, our thinking, even our language come from our evolutionary past. So this was a, uh, a huge breakthrough in terms of how we understand, well, it did two things. Firstly, how, where we come from, where our ideas, where, where mind comes from. But secondly, what insights we might get from looking at other animals, because there is a continuity, there is a link there. And if you go for, far enough back, there is a common ancestor and therefore common traits may well have a common common source. So uh, this I, the idea of evolution by natural selection, I mean, it didn't immediately uh, convince, necessarily convince those, I mean, I don't suppose Wallace changed his mind <laughs> immediately. I don't suppose he didn't change his mind ever yeah. um, on, on that question. Uh, but it changed the framework and really cemented the significance of a comparative approach and the legitimacy of a comparative approach uh, to study of, of human behavior and human mind. So uh, another figure who you mention in the book um, is sort of moving um, the field forward or the, the kind of horizon of human knowledge is uh, a Spanish guy called Ramon E. Cajal, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Pretty good as, bad, um, as good as mine. <laughs> yeah, well, my my girlfriend's Spanish, so I had I I was like, how do you pronounce this? And I just have forgotten as well. But um, yeah, so um, what what is it that he kind of discovers in with, with his kind of experimentation that that kind of progresses um, our understanding of what it is that the brain does, what it is that these nerves are doing? Well, he he, he showed what the brain's made of. Basically, he shows the brain is made of nerves, and these nerves are se single cells. So probably the if you think about the 19th century, the history of 19th century science, there's a lot of particles about. People were discovering, you know, they came up eventually, they had the atomic theory from Dalton in Manchester. Um, and then there's the discovery much later on of electrons and all the, the idea of you've got particles, the idea of the uh, eventually of the um, uh, of the, the, the periodic table and so on. So you've got this trying to find fundamental components and from the 1830s onwards it was realized that all bodies are made of cells single these single separate structures and that eventually helped people to work out um, how babies are made and the equivalence of two things that don't look very equivalent i a very very tiny and highly motile sperm on the one hand of which there are bazillions and a very large and normally singular and immotile egg and the, 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 their equivalence is they're both single cells. And that right. eventually people were able to work out. So you've got a lot of reduction to fundamental units. And cell theory changed our ways of looking at bodies. But there's one part of the body that proved um, recalcitrant to this attempt. And that was studying nervous systems. What were nerves and brains made out of? Were they made up of complicated... Uh, kind of networks and this was encouraged by the idea that because of people were using comparative methods and trying to uh, come up with stains ways of uh, dyeing nervous systems so you could look at them under uh, the microscope some of the earliest uh, nervous systems they looked at were those of organisms that don't have a brain uh, various jellyfish for example which have a network of neurons connected together because they were relatively easy to study and the degree of resolution they had initially um, was suggested that our nerves were like this as well. And what uh, Cajal was able to do through a series of uh, technical uh, developments, some of which came about by chance, which built on other developments by chance, uh, was to show that these nerves 
uh, neuro nerve cells are completely separate, that they are single structures. They are all cells, but they have a, a an identity and they are connected. So this did two things. It, 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 it showed a universality of all nervous systems. We all have the same structure, just like egg and sperm or eggs, uh, cells. But it also then raised the question of, well, what's in a nerve? And how does it go from one end to another? Because he noticed that he's, his diagrams, we can see, he starts to put arrows on them, um, starts to th think about things going from one side, one end to another. He noticed that neurons have a have a beginning, sensory neurons in particular, those involved in vision and touch and so on, have a, an outside and they they kind of point one way, not literally, but yeah, kind of. Yeah. So there's a directionality to the nervous system. It doesn't go every which way like a net. And secondly, that means there's something in a nerve, but then th there's a gap between the two. Now he, he 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 noticed the gaps. He didn't give them a name or anything like that. But he did. He 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 knew that there was this this point at which they came together. Now what was in the nerves, he didn't know. I mean, most people thought it was some kind of electricity, but if it was, it was a very weird kind of electricity. People were able to do uh, measures of uh, the rapidity with which uh, the nervous message, let's put it that way, it's about as strong as I'm prepared to use. Because <laughs> words count and words yeah, yeah. transpose them back. And you know now you talk about signal, information, yeah, all those I, words that come from the twentieth century. So yeah, and you uh, impose message, it on message is allowable, I think, just. Um, but it's very very hard to do because we are interpreting what was confused, but we know is we can now interpret it much better than they can because they were in the past, they didn't have all the understanding. So they they've done the best they can, just as we are doing the best they can. Yeah, we yeah. can, but they're peering into a into a glass darkly they can't yeah. quite see it all so people had measured the speed of what goes down a nerve and it was much much it was the order of about 400 miles an hour which is much much slower than say the speed in an electric wire in a telegraph wire right so if nerves were like telegraphs which was the big metaphor of the 19th century right. they were a, got a weird kind of electricity because it didn't go anywhere near as fast mm -hmm. so if we jump on a little bit then to our next thinker and i think um i don't know if this was you who described it this way or if this was one of um mcculloch's kind of like apocryphal um stories about um pitts what walter pitts uh, where he was described as a collective delusion by those who met him yeah well, <laughs> it was it wasn't mcculloch who, who called that somebody else said that so oh, this okay. is this um <laughs> walter pitts yeah i mean he was this uh Un completely untrained, absolutely brilliant mathematician. So, you know, all those kind of tropes you get in films, you know, what a beautiful mind and all the rest of it. Uh, Walter Pitts was this and he was real. He wasn't a collective delusion, but a lot of uh, a lot of people <laughs> believed he must be. Um, he had absolutely no uh, academic training. Uh, he left school at 15 and yet uh, he could think in logical terms and understood the idea cutting edge ideas of logic which were being developed by Turing and others in the 1930s. He developed them with uh, McCulloch, who was much, much older than him, was a primary physiologist and kind of sensed the way that the wind was blowing without being able to articulate this idea that Pitts came up with and other people like Shannon, who was uh, the founder of Inform one of the co-founders of information theory. And this is all happening at the same time uh, at the end of the 1930s, beginning of the 1940s. The idea that we can represent uh, what happens in nervous systems, the way that nervous systems are wired up. There's another metaphor um, uh, or the way that we could create a computer is all similar, or the way that messages are sent by Morse code, for example, that there is some fundamentally similar way of understanding that, and that can be conceived of mathematically, if you are uh, Shannon or uh, Norbert Wiener, who came up with a very similar idea at the same time in the early 1940s, or in, in uh, terms of logic, which is what uh, Pitts and McCulloch came up with. And Pitts and McCulloch wrote what was an incredibly influential paper in 1943, which suggested that you could wire, you could organize, nervous systems were organized on a logical basis. 
And the way that messages went from one set of neurons to another could be conceived of in terms of these very sexy ideas at the time of logic. That is, in terms of if something is happening, then this will happening is happening, or th this will happen then. So if, then, or, and, these operators, as they're called, which are generally written in capital letters uh, in logical uh, notation, they were how nervous systems were organized, they claim. And there was what they called an imminent logic to nervous system structure. And this proved incredibly influential and is also completely wrong. So it was incredibly influential uh, because, so we all think now that uh, the brain's like a computer. And we, people do think that. But the really interesting thing is that when computers were developed, digital computers, not the kind of analog computer that Turing uh, was interested in, we first built in Manchester, uh, programmable computers like that, but digital computers, the way that they were constructed, which were, took place uh, in the uh, immediate post-war period, they were based von Neumann, who designed the structures that we are using now, every one of our digital devices in the whole planet uses a von Neumann architecture. Von Neumann based his idea on McCulloch and Pitts's conception of what nervous systems do. In other words, he said, right. we're going to build a computer. It's going to be like a brain. <laughs> now, yeah. in fact, nervous systems aren't wired up like that at all. They're not wired at all they're very very flexible and they don't have the structure that McCulloch and Pitts thought they did but this is one of the many examples in the book of a wrong idea or what we would now consider to be a wrong idea or only partially correct idea turning out to be incredibly uh, influential so McCulloch and Pitts as I said has been really really influential but it's been cited I looked at about 9,000 times but virtually all of them from computer scientists. And I spoke to a friend who's a leading neuroscientist. And I said, well, what do you think of McCulloch and Pitts? She said, never heard of it. I sent it to her and she said, well, I'm not surprised I've never heard of it. It's complete rubbish because it, it, it is not right. You know, nervous systems aren't organized. So it's a really nice idea, but you know, any neurophysiologist at the time could, and they did tell them, uh, no, sorry, it's not like this. <laughs> Good idea, but that's not how it works but it's brilliant for, for building a computer. So w would you say that this is more just a sort of conceptual trap or what, what are the, um, I suppose, what are the good things about, about this? Cause I, I think, um, I, I like you, am slowly becoming skeptical of our ability currently to understand things. Um, but when I, when I initially, you know, was, was learning about how computers work and how transistors work and the kind of like, um, the the logic that's instantiated in hardware and how it's like oh hang on these guys are saying um that neurons work that same way that you you know you can you can basically so so i could instantiate the way that this hardware is in the brain what why couldn't i do make a computer that's like that this is really promising and obviously there's you know i'm, I'm not the only person who had that idea as i was learning things other people <laughs> far more intelligent have tried and thought so so what but what are the good things about um that that does how how does that help um progress be made i suppose in in, in well this, it's, this. it's helped us because this is the basic framework this kind of information information processing uh framework that neurons in particular sensory neurons uh receive stimulation they turn that into some kind of signal which is not digital neurons are not digital in any meaningful sense of the word so that's the first thing that shows you they're not like computers because you know they've and von neumann worked this out because he was interested in this and he was all these people were thinking about these ideas in the second half of the 1940s and von neumann very quickly realized that there was no way that this would work he couldn't build a model of the human brain. Uh, it would have to be bigger than the universe. I mean, he okay, right. he didn't have he didn't have transistors. They had only just been conceived of, and they weren't commercially available. But even so, um, he realised that bodies have a, a very strong analog component. Component that's how nervous systems work. But you know, the basic idea is that you've got a, a stimulus that your neuron is somehow responding to that, just like a transponder. Uh, it sends, sends information that you could conceive of mathematically downstream into the brain, where it is then processed by um, uh, 
uh, downstream detectors, as they're called, uh, which somehow do some kind of weird magic. There's some kind of observer, some set of structures, or, you know, you might conceive that as a little mini-me sitting inside, uh, which then receives this signal and interprets it appropriately. And that has proved incredibly powerful. I mean, that is that is behind all the uh, the conceptual and therapeutic some of the important therapeutic insights we've got and are getting and are beginning to get um, in terms of providing, for example, uh, sensory artificial, uh, so, so um, cochlear implants, for example, that's working basically right. on that kind of idea. And that's the, the transhumanist fantasy that you can replace any of these organs uh, with some kind of device. Uh, you know, that's Musk's idea of putting in these, you know, uh, Neuralink stuff, new electrodes in your brain, and then uh, you know, doing stuff. So I mean, leave leave aside that. Let's concentrate on the sensible things, the important things that have proved it significant. So it has it has shaped the last seventy years of discovery, and I'm part of that. And in my uh, my writings about the functioning of the olfactory system, you'll find exactly this kind of language. Um, now, so this is a, as a heuristic, as a framework, as an interpretive model, a way of saying, okay, well, this is what the world's like. How do we, how can it work if this is how it works? It has proved incredibly powerful. I think, and this is kind of the theme of the final, well, the second and third halves of the book, because the second half of the book is about where we are now, mm -hmm. I, from 1950 to the present day, and it, it, some people have complained saying, well, it's no longer strictly chronological. Well, it, it, it couldn't be because, you know, neuroscience yeah, so just exploded. There are hundreds of thousands of neuroscientists. So it couldn't do it chronologically. It wouldn't have made any sense. So it's thematic by memory, um, mental yeah. health issues and different things like that. Um, and that whole framework has been shaped by this way of looking at brains, perhaps a little bit less with the neurochemistry uh, and our chemical approaches to mental health. Uh, but in basically, that is what has shaped what we've understood. But as I tried to show, and this isn't particularly my view, this is, or, you know, I'm not unique, I'm not a spokesman or anything. Uh, there are large numbers of, for the last 20 odd years, so it's, a, it's been going on for a time, as we've got more and more data from both model uh, animal systems, but also from the human brain structures, uh, images from fMRI and so on, and more and more complicated data, it has become apparent that we don't really have a, a model beyond, well, okay, it's a like, bit like a computer, it's processing data. Okay, great. Well, how does that work then? Uh, that's when it all starts to fall apart. We don't have a framework. There's no agreed theoretical framework, even for the simplest of brains. And, you know, I, declaration of interest, I study maggots, right, which got 10,000 neurons. You've got about 80 billion neurons plus load of other, you know, billions of other cells in there. So it gives you some idea of the the, the, the difference in size. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we don't have any theoretical framework for understanding how these nervous systems work. We, we've got a load of tools and increasing, increasingly uh, rich and sometimes beautiful measures of those, the structure and activity of those new nervous systems, but making any sense of it even of the simplest ones, and it's the key point I tried to get over in the book, and I think people are generally kind of a bit gobsmacked about this. The example I use is a lobster's stomach. Okay, so I said, yeah. you've got 80 billion neurons. Yeah, was there 30 or so? Am I remembering Maggot's that got 10,000 in its brain. The lobster's stomach, so not its brain, the lobster's stomach has got about 30 neurons. And these neurons are, are connected together. We know everything there is to know about them. We can study their exact organization, their the synapses, the chemical messages that go from one neuron to another, the patterning of their activity, the genes that are expressed in them at different moments. We can study all that in incredible detail. And these neurons together produce two rhythms, which enable the, uh, the muscles of the uh, stomach to grind. OK, so it's got to grind up its food. So you can imagine having two states, you got one kind of activity, and then it shifts over and does another kind of mm. set of activity. 
we don't know how it works basically <laughs> and people you can model it you can you can't predict from the best models we have what will happen if we alter the activity of one of those neurons we take it out we change its activity in a defined way and that for me is understanding i you've got a model of something and it's sufficiently yeah, rich and it makes predict what will happen if you do something and we don't have that uh, this is the work of eve marder uh in america and she's incredibly smart and she still can't work out the lobster's stomach. So that is the challenge. And one of the things that you know, doesn't annoy me, but kind of frustrates me vaguely. So there's a lot of very, very smart people who, uh, until recently, who, when they suddenly become epidemiologists, were previously uh, being uh, neuroscien computational neuroscientists uh, looking at um, trying to come up with models of consciousness using computers. And I just think, look, you know, Deal with something we really know. We know what the lobster's stomach looks like. We know what it does. It only does two things, right? Surely, you know, if you're so smart, figure that out. Test your models on that. And if you can get that, then maybe we can start to get at more high level things. Now, this is a, a very reductionist approach, and I, I don't think it's the only one we should take. But it is a kind of salutary reminder, especially when you're kind of boggled by some of the maths or in my case all of the maths in these papers just to remember well they don't have the slightest idea where's the data how does this fit on to actual real really functioning neuros nervous systems and so this relates as well to ideas about the connectome we're going to have a wiring diagram we'll be able to know everything but both theoretically and practically that's that's not true so Nervous systems are flexible. They change over time. Uh, they're different between individuals. So even C. elegans, the worm, which has 302, I think, or nine, I can never remember, neurons. It doesn't really have a brain. It has kind of eight neurons that are connected together vaguely at the head. Um, they're not all that, you know, you think, well, that, that looks pretty much like a robot. We know exactly where all these it's thousand odd cells, 300 neurons go, what they do, how they talk to each other. We've known this for decades, but they're different. <laughs> They've got personalities. They behave differently from one individual to another. So it's not just about the wiring diagram. It's about the chemistry, the ele electrochemistry right. uh, that's uh, going on inside them and about their experience, about their interaction with the environment. We don't understand that yet. Uh, now, I don't think that means we shouldn't be doing anything else. But as I say, uh, let's just be a bit humble and use those fascinating data, connectomic, uh, RNA-seq, which is, tells you what genes are doing what in which cells, all that data. Try explaining that with your fancy models. Let's see where that gets us. And maybe you can you might find that, you know, your models are actually right and can prove all this and explain it all. Brilliant. We've made a huge advance. Or you might find, oh. The data seem to be incommensurate. I can't work it out with my model. So your model is not rich enough to explain that. Well, good enough. Good luck with explaining how consciousness emerges out of a few kilos of mushy gray stuff in my head. I I have a bunch of questions that I would love to get out, but I don't I don't want to take up um, so much of your time. But um, just to, to briefly touch on, um, for example, you talked about um, Heb and like Hebb's law and neurons that um, fire together, wire together, like uh, the search for um, like grandmother cells and se cells that are associated with memory and Jennifer Aniston and so <laughs> forth um, in the book. You talk about um, chemistry and how um, perhaps an attempt to reduce um, things like depression entirely to chemistry as well might not be um, entirely helpful, though they've been useful. Oh, in you just, um, have you gone? It's my fault. Let me bring back. It's okay. You've gone. It sounds gone. Oh, what? <laughs> get, no, it's I'm me. It's here. me. Can you hear me? I've something to my speaker. Hang on, I know what I'll do. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> right, go now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Am yeah, I yeah. Back? yeah. Okay, that's much better. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you touch a little bit on um, mental health and, and chemistry, um, a little bit on myths as well, which you describe as um, neurobollocks. So, for example, the um, the idea of like a reptilian uh, mammalian and sort of like modern brain. I mean, obviously, it, it sort of is built like that, but the reductions aren't quite there. And you and you see certain phenomena that are attributed to um, one of these kind of like categories. Well, you see them in other species 
which don't have those kind of architectures. So so it can't it can't be that it's entirely reducible to just that. Um, and another thing I thought was really interesting, you talk about the hunt for the neural correlates of consciousness and how that might sort of be inappropriate based off of um, people trying to figure out how processes work by kind of like remove a transistor and see what that changes. Um, I don't, uh, and all sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, wasp, wasp it's now, a long wasp, book, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> What wasps on uh, like rep representing uh, the thing that they're building in their brain for certain experiments, brain organoids um, that people are building. But I don't think there's time to go through all of that <laughs> stuff right now. But there, there are some book, folks. There's a, there's a couple of questions though in the chat, um, which if you've got ten minutes yeah, yeah, or so, true. hopefully we yeah, can yeah. go into. Yeah. Um, so Derek from Myth Vision Podcast, um, who I'm guessing he'll probably be interested in reaching out to you at some point to, to oh, come on talk an issue. Yeah. Um, he's asked, has our understanding of the brain solved uh, the hard problem of consciousness? Not in the slightest. Well, well, yes and no. Okay, so there is no evidence going in any other direction than that the brain produces consciousness from its activity. So all of the evidence from st electrical stimulation shows very, very clearly that that is the case. And in mice, we, for example, create memories in a mice's brain. We can make a mouse afraid of a particular corner that it's never been to. We can make a mouse remember a smell that it's never smelled. So memory is malleable. We can actually create memories. It really is. And they call it inception in the article. Um, in humans, we know that visual perception can be altered by the pulse of an electrode. And in a way, that's not really surprising because, you know, anybody who's taken any hallucinogenic drug will know perfectly well that, you know, you can alter your perception by chemical means, but you can do it electri electrically very, very precisely. Precise cells even can produce really very, very strong emotions of uh, I forgot what they call it. They call it something like uh, they, they they did a study in which they they stimulated very very precise parts of patients' brains, several different patients, and they, they recorded they responded with exactly the same sensation that they were getting ready to meet some immense challenge, like they had to swim out to a boat to save their lives. And really really strong emotion, but incredibly precise, and it disappeared the instant that they stopped stimulating. And then they put it back on again, and they had this terrible feeling again. So all the data we have suggests goes in that direction. It doesn't go in the direction of, well, you know, there's some weird thing in your head, right? On the other hand, how that works, I have no idea, right? right. And nobody else does. And uh, I mean, there are a number of different uh, views about this. Um, the two main computational approaches are currently, I believe, uh, trying to work out some uh, competing uh, predictions that they both might make that they could then test. And that'd be great. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, at one point my editor said to me, so, so how does the brain work? And I said, I haven't the faintest idea. Nobody else does. And he said, we well, can't say that every book about the brain has got to have a, a you know, an explanation. It's got to have a, a hook. And I said, well, there isn't one. Uh, and in a bizarre way, that's what's turned out to be the hook. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell it like it is. I'll tell the book tells you what the scientists say in those meetings at the conferences when they're having a drink after the, the conference where they go, you know what, we haven't the faintest idea. Yeah. Go, no, we haven't. Let's have another one. Yeah, I, I think uh, the book was incredibly fair in um, sort of articulating the progress um, and the power of the sciences, but also not overstating that case because there are a lot of questions unanswered. And um, I think sometimes people can want to say, you know, I've got, I've got it all figured out with my theory over here. Whereas if I think you were, it, it was good, it was refreshing to read something where you were sort of a bit more balanced in between. Well, I, uh, I don't have skin in the game. You got to remember, yeah. I study the, the smell cells of maggots, right? <laughs> Nobody cares about that. Right. Well, we don't understand how it works, so, it, <laughs> um, so I don't. Yeah. You know, I don't myself. I don't have any. You know, I, no, my academic career is not based on trying to understand how the brain works. Um, Mitch has asked, "Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Mark Soames and his thoughts on the source of consciousness, which I think is in the brainstem?" For those who aren't familiar, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so there is. You've just got to think it again. Everyday experience tells you some very weird things. You know, you wake up, 
So if you've had a bit too much to drink and you think you're going to be sick, you will wake up instantly and you are wide awake and then you want to go up and be, be sick. Or if you have sleep apnea, your oxygen levels drop, your CO2 levels increase and cells in your brain stem, stem somehow they are, and I'm using a metaphor here, they pull the switch and instantly the fires of consciousness, more metaphors, are woofed up and you're there. There's no kind of, in, there's no there's no middle period. You are instantly awake. And obviously evolution has done that for all sorts of very sensible reasons. But it's telling us something about the, at least one route to consciousness. And the same thing with, same thing with um, anesthetics. Without wishing to alarm anybody who's about to have a general anesthetic, yeah. we have no idea how it works. <laughs> but but that is, I mean, it is amazing. You know, the, it, thank God it works. Um, and you know the fact that you could the 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 person there with all the the gas canisters is an artist, right? They know what works. They know how it works. They know what works exactly what to give you to put you under. That's why they do that counting thing, count down to to ten. You think no problem. You get to seven. That's it. Um, they know exactly what they're doing, and they can turn it on and off. And that is in some way, it's almost certainly is going to be deep down in the brainstem. This is one of the things that Crick was interested in, trying to find those neural correlates of consciousness, things that are involved. And I suspect, but I don't have any proof and I'm, it's not my field. I suspect that those uh, the, the structures in our brainstems that enable us to instantly wake up when uh, our CO2 levels fall too low or we want to be sick or something like that, that might be one route to getting at what's going on, but it, it, it's very difficult to, they, they may be very small structures and that's very, very difficult to study. Um, another person asks, um, is is this, I guess, from what we were talking about a little bit before, um, a strong case against the idea that consciousness can survive death? And we, we've done some videos in the past talking about like near-death experiences, some famous okay. cases like, um, Pam Reynolds, who had like an aneurysm on her brain and stuff like that. Do you? I, I don't know if you're familiar with any of these and how people. Well, put them I, forward. I, I just know that the, the key thing is that somebody did an experiment because people were having near death experiences. So they put something in, a, in an operating theater on top of a, a filing cabinet. Nobody could ever, you know, people say, well, I was floating about. Yeah. Nobody could ever say what was on top of the filing cabinet. No, I mean, this is just your brain. <laughs> I mean, I hope it's that way because it sounds quite nice, you know. So even if it's pretty grim when I eventually go, um, I will feel as though I'm going into the light. Um, well, there is no evidence for life, for exist persistence of consciousness after death. I mean, you know, as I said earlier on, I mean, if you want to, you know, if a philosopher wants to twist my arm, I can't prove any of this. But, you know, I accept many things that I cannot finally prove because there is an accumulation of evidence that goes in the same direction. And the material basis of consciousness is one of them. And, you know, cups of coffee prove that to me because my body is being altered by a drug I take. And that changes my perception and my mental activity. There's, you know, it's all based on physiology uh, and everything we've discovered in the last Two three hundred years has gone in exactly uh, that direction, and that means I'm afraid that there is no life after death, and that your consciousness can't be uploaded to a computer. And when you're dead, that's it. Grim but true. Um, inquiring reality has asked, "How will the genetics revolution? I'm guessing he's referring to like CRISPR and stuff like mm -hmm. that, affect neuroscience and mental health treatment in the coming century?" Um, well, I hope a lot better than it has done in the last <laughs> in the last period. Um, so, I mean, this is really not making a joke. This is really depressing. So the reality is that we have made in, in the 1950s and early 1960s, we made huge breakthroughs uh, in the neurochemical basis of uh, mental health treatments. Um, but this was largely through luck, uh, either people finding drugs like LSD, which then led on to uh, the discovery of other treatments. Many of these treatments, we've had a cycle of boom and bust. It's fantastic, everybody wants to use it. And then a few years later, it doesn't work so well. We discover it has withdrawal effects. It gives you cancer or various yeah. drugs have come and gone like that. Um, and at the moment, I think the key thing is none of the big pharmaceutical companies, none of them have an active psychiatric 
wing. They are not looking for any trucks yeah. because there's no money in it because they don't know how it works. They can't see any way forward to making money. So they pulled out completely. And that, you know, if, if, if people can't see how to make money from it, it shows there's no cures coming down the line. Um, genetic basis of dro uh, uh, mental health is again approved extremely complicated because we know there are genetic factors involved, but they are really, really complex. There's going to be lots and lots of genes doing very small things. People have talked about the genetic basis of schizophrenia and so on. And there are clearly inherited components to this. But that doesn't mean to say we know what, you know, there's a gene or even a hundred genes or even a thousand genes involved in it. It is hideously complicated. Will we get a better understanding of that by the end of the century? Um, I hope so, but I've no idea what it would look like. Um, and it's it, it's it's normally these things. Oh, you know, if people are confident about something. They say, oh, well, in five or ten years. Well, you know, I'm talk. I would I reckon decades away. And that's grim for people who have problems uh, or people who live with people who have problems. That's very very hard. And all of us who've been in that situation know how difficult it is. Um, yeah. So uh, no no false hope from me. I'm afraid. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Have have you looked into um, like what Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt are doing around psilocybin research? Um, yeah, do you have I mean, any thoughts on I've got a lot of time for Nutt. Um, I mean, he's been awfully treated by uh, the, the Good British point. state because of their crazed ideas about what drugs are safe and not. Because he dared to say that, you know, smoking a joint was less dangerous than uh, riding a horse, which is just kind of obvious, you know? I mean, how many people <laughs> died from smoking joints last year? And then last week, that poor jockey got thrown and died. So anyway, um, I've got a lot of time for him. Um, and it seems to me, I mean, th the initial discovery of LSD then led to lots and lots of insights about how uh, neurotransmitters work and their role on perception and on uh, behavior and so on. Um, I, I think these are very, they're going to be very difficult things. There will not be a one size fit all happy pill. Be great if there was, uh, that's not going to happen because everybody's, uh, psychological problems are going to be slightly different, be a complex mixture of genes and environment and genuine, you know, I mean, I think part of the issue is that it's okay to feel sad and miserable and we all feel crap at the moment because of the pandemic. Yeah. Well, that's right, because it's awful. And yeah, it, yeah. on a planetary scale, it's dreadful. On a personal scale, for most of us, it's merely frustrating. But that frustration is very real. We're isolated. We're not with other people. And that's OK. Um, it's not OK. You know what I mean? It's it, it's yeah, legit. Yeah. It's a it's a it's a rational it's the appropriate response. response. Yeah. yeah, it's a rational response to a completely irrational situation. And maybe we've got kind of over medicalized and there are some aspects of our emotions that we need to <sighs> cope with if we can with help from friends um, paul has asked um he says he's recently listened to the master and his em emissary by ian mcgillchrist and are um at there any recent developments in the role slash relationship between the brain hemispheres yeah i read that because i felt i had to goodness me what an awful book um <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So look, your brain is one structure. Okay. It is a structure. It is the two sides of your brain. You don't have a left brain and a right brain that are doing different things or in struggle. You can get that if you do something awful to somebody and cut their brain in half, which happened primarily for therapeutic reasons. Um, then you get a very, very weird emergence of two slightly different presences, minds, whatever you want to call them, one of which has control over language because this side of the brain controls language. And so my, uh, my this, side of the, this side of the brain is involved in producing thought, in producing speech, and this side of the brain isn't and can't. Right. So if you separate the two sides of the brain, this side of the brain has to deal without speech. That doesn't mean to say you've got two sides of the brain, oh, I'm a left, terrible left brain, oh, I'm a right brain. Yeah. That's all rubbish. There's no good, evidence. good at maths in uh, in high school, so you must be a left brain. <laughs> no, but you might be very yeah. good at languages, right? I mean, that's not nonsense because language, music, maths, they tend to, and that's one reason why kids can absorb absorb uh, absorb languages like a sponge. And also, you get mathematical and musical geniuses. You don't get biological geniuses age five, right? 
right? So there is something to that. Those are similar yeah, yeah. Um, capacities in ways we don't understand that are part of this flexibility uh, of, in particular, the growing brain. And yeah, as I say, remember, you do get those the, the, those uh, prodigies uh, in maths and music. Mozart was one. I don't know if he was any good at maths, but he was certainly good at good at music. I don't think he's, he's very good in his accounts anyway. He was crap at that, but he was certainly no, a, a I, musical I genius. Yeah. Um, but uh, they are similar kind of struct, and that's one reason why learn as many languages as you can when you're young. Once you get old, learning a language, learning a musical instrument gets very hard. But you might be uh, able to what that. age? <laughs> what age? Well, it's with puberty, I think, when most crap things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'm going to have I'll to go in a couple of minutes. One yeah, of my kids don't worry. Disappeared out of the loft window, so I'm going to have to rescue if, it. If we do, um, one more question. And just yeah. in case there's not time at the end, someone gave you um, a compliment as well. Your ability to speak is genuinely something I aspire towards, extremely clear and easy to understand. It's my day job. <laughs> <laughs> I get a lot of practice. Um, and Jurassic Bombastic has asked, uh, yeah. do you think anything on the atomic level could tell us something sociologically? There's the question. That is the question, okay? Um, so this is a question about reductionism, and it's about yeah. question and determinism, how much of what we are and what we do is determined at the molecular atomic level. At one level, yes. So we don't know what the genetic basis of speech is, but there is a genetic basis to it. Only humans can speak. So speech, which is the essence of you know, our society without being able to speak, that is determined by our genes. So ultimately is determined by proteins and by genes acting on other genes. And that's molecules, that's atomic atoms. And that's the way it works. On the other hand, if you want to understand why I speak English and not French, it's no good looking at that level. You can't understand it at that level. You've got to understand, well, wait a minute, he was brought up in England. I don't actually speak French, but that's because I went, went and lived in France. I don't speak German at all. So that is to do with something at a higher level. And there's a, a, a big discussion, which I, I don't, I'm not terribly satisfied with in the book because I don't really resolve it. But my excuse is it's very hard and I don't know what the answer is um, about emergent properties and right. reductionism and how much you can rely one on the other. I think you can have be a, an advocate of reductionism without thinking that everything is determined at the molecular level. Um, right. So me being able to speak is determined by my genes. Me speaking English is a pure chance of where my parents met or where I was born and grew up. So it's, it's very complicated in other words, isn't it? <laughs> but, yeah. Take out message. Too long, didn't read. It's complicated, man. Well, thank you for coming on. Um, there's plenty more questions in the chat and I had my own questions and everything, but it, you know, they, we, we could keep talking about this for a long time. I'm sure it's a really interesting subject. Um, so that where, where's the best place for people to get hold of the book? Um, well, your local from bookshop, not from, not from Jeff Bezos. So uh, you can get it, uh, although you can get it a Kindle. There, I think there are the books available. Um, you know what? I would, if you can't go to a local bookshop or you don't want to because you're shielding or whatever, I would go to uk.bookshop.org and that gives some money to local bookshops. So it's uh, it's uh, Amazon without the horror, without the guilt. And yeah, there you go. This is the book. This is the book. Awesome. Um, and also, so I'm going to. I'm going to end the stream. End the stream there. Then, is there anywhere else where people can just find you? Is it on Twitter, Matthew Cobb? I'm um, Twitter anywhere? at Matthew Cobb. One one word. Um, they can email me. Please, if you've got a theory of consciousness, can you not email it to me? I have had rather a lot of them, mainly from retired men. And as shortly a retired man, I have promised never to do that. So please don't email me your your theories. <laughs> Thank you. I'll end the stream there. And thank you, everyone. For